Chapter 38. Isaiah chapter 38. Hi, Charlie. Hi. How are you? Good. We were talking about you earlier. And then we realized you weren't here. So I asked Andrew to do the offering instead. Isaiah chapter 38 tonight. We have fresh air in here. Do you notice that? It's not stale and stuffy. Do you notice that the bad smells go down when it's when the air is dehumidified and cooler too? It's just a lot of benefits to air conditioning. Uh, by the way, Charlie wasn't late this evening. He was actually on a mission. He was out destroying air conditioning of all the people that are missing church this evening and leaving little notes that says air conditioning at church. <laughs> Houses. So he was... But that's our new strategy, right, Charlie? Is uh, let people know they, they think that they'll stifle a church. Let them know that we have oxygen here. What was the name? Our new name for our church? Chill oxygen. Yeah. Chill, chill oxygen. Chill oxygen. Chill oxygen. No. Yeah. Chill oxygen. Not hashtag. Oh yeah, not hashtag church. Yeah. So chill oxygen church. Oh, we were thinking about how that when you drop the room temperature, cold air is is more dense. So there's actually more more oxygen in a cool room than a hot room. And so, you know, chilled oxygen church. Matter of fact, we may just turn the place into a freezer. I'm going to kick that third AC <laughs> in there a little bit. We're going to really be all set. Think so, Stacy? Turn on the third one? No. Well, we'll just use it for a backup for maybe. <laughs> okay. You don't want us to break your home AC either, do you? There is no AC, so that doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> nothing for you guys to break. <laughs> All right. Stop messing around and get in the Word of God. Isaiah 38. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall prayed unto the Lord and said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee, how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah cried his eyes out. Or Hezekiah wept sore. All right, let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us as we go to the Scripture this evening, Lord, to see a model and example about how to literally channel not only the circumstances that are going on around us, but ultimately, Father, to channel the way we feel about the circumstances into a way uh, that, God, we get a hold of you and we see you. Lord, I just pray that you would uh, bless us with understanding this evening. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I just, um, I just love this, this passage of Scripture. This is a great story. And the neat thing about it is that it's actually laid out sort of uh, like a documentary. In other words, it starts off with the, this is what happened, like the report. And the report was that Hezekiah, or, you know, while everything else was going on, Hezekiah was sick unto death, and God sent Isaiah to tell him, you're going to die and not live, and Isaiah wept sore. And that's the report. So there's the little news article, the news clip. You ever read something in the news, and then you have like a million questions? Don't you hate it how that... You, like today reporting, there's nothing in the actual story. There's everything in the headline. In other words, they actually write a story and all they know is the headline, basically. And there's nothing more than that. It doesn't answer any of the questions. For instance, uh, was it Fresno where the, where the Muslim guy this week shot? Yes. yes. Yeah, it was Fresno. They had another shooting. Yes. And so Fresno... There's a guy that shot. Well, when I hear a guy shot something, I want to hear the details. You know what? It's been running around and around and around on the news, but I haven't heard any other details other than he yelled, Allah Akbar, or something like that, or Allah, whatever the, you know, means I'm Muslim, I'm killing people. And, and now they're calling it a hate crime because he was killing specifically white people. And, and so it wasn't terrorism because he was just killing white people. It was just a hate crime. So anyway... Oh, I don't know if that's an upgrade or a downgrade. Depends on your perspective, I suppose. <laughs> and it didn't used to be a hate crime to kill white people, so I guess it may be like an upgraded status for it not to be terrorism. 
that's a political commentary. My point is this. Sometimes you read a headline, and then they, it'll sucker you in. You know, what do they call those things? The headline that's a, uh, what do they call it? What? Clickbait. Yeah, clickbait. Yeah, see, you're way back pre-millennial. He's like, Joel, Joel even knows clickbait. Okay, so clickbait. They put it out there to get you to click on You click on it, and you realize there's nothing more in the story than was in the headline. Just a whole bunch more words, but the same thing. It's a little frustrating, isn't it? Well, there's more to this story. In other words, there's the reporting, there's the account. Hezekiah got sick while everything was going on, and God said, you're going to die, Hezekiah. And then, and then Hezekiah started crying. And that's the headline, and that's the report. But then there is what you always hope happens when something happens, is that somebody gets an exclusive. Somebody gets an exclusive and actually gets to interview the person. I read an article, a sports article, uh, I think it was yesterday. I don't know how I ended up reading on I probably clicked on some clickbait. But it actually ended up being an article about a guy that had interviewed Charles Barkley. And here's the funny thing about it. Charles Barkley said, I'll give you an interview uh, if you'll come with me to the golf course. And then he tried to lose him on his way home to change to go golfing. And so he cut off some traffic and so forth. The guy was driving a rental car. Charles Barkley was driving a car that an NBA player could afford. And he had a hard time keeping up. But after he had already endangered his life like for a couple turns trying to keep up with Charles Barkley, Charles Barkley realized, okay, he really wants to interview me. He's trying to keep up. And so then he gave him a nice interview and so forth. And uh, I had a point in that. Oh, there was more in the story. There was more in the story than uh, the clickbait on it. It actually had some insightful things about Charles Barkley and got a lot of really personal things about him. And I thought, well, that's a nice article to read about Charles Barkley. I read a great article the other day, too, about Dwight Howard, actually. You know the guy, the guy that's going to single-handedly bring a championship one day to Atlanta? Char Dwight Howard. I mean, a legitimately, a legit superstar, or used to be anyway, <laughs> uh, basketball player. And I read a great article by Dwight Howard, and the thing, there was a couple things in the article deep down in it that I found very interesting. One, is that I didn't remember this or know this, but when he first got into the NBA, Dwight Howard said, the main thing I want to do is tell people about Jesus Christ and that he's the only way for salvation. <clears throat> and in the article, one of the things he said, is, you know, he said, you know, some of the things that I've done personally have really detracted from the message of Jesus Christ, but it's about Jesus, not about me. And, uh, you know, he's still, he's still the only way. And I thought, well, that's really nice that uh, a guy would... When you, when you get an exclusive interview, one of the things he still wants to say after being in the NBA for 10 years is that, yeah, you know what, I'm not everything a Christian should be, but Jesus is everything that he ought to be. And I thought that was nice. And he said some other, I, I kind of like Dwight Howard a lot better now after reading that article. This is a really good article and had in additional information. And so when you get an exclusive interview with somebody, you kind of get some extra insight. In other words, if we could interview the guy from Fresno, and find out, he said, you know, when the police took him, the things that he said was, I just wanted to kill white people, but he was yelling Allah Akbar when he wanted to do it. And so I'd like to have an interview with him and find out all the things that motivate him, the things that cause this man whose name is Mohammed to become a Muslim and to want to massacre people. In other words, I think that would be interesting and it would be a good article. Here we have a text, back to our context. Here we have a text where we have the, this happened, and then Hezekiah says, I'm going to write what actually happened. Um, one last example of what I'm talking about. Uh, American Terrorist is a book I, I don't necessarily recommend you reading just because it's, it's thick, voluminous, and it is um, just not worth your time. I could summarize, or you could read a summary and do as well. But I read the book American Terrorist, and it was by a journalist who got an exclusive interview of mm -hmm. Tim McVeigh. And so he really, you know, you want to wonder, why, why would a guy do something like what he did? And so he, by the time you read it, you got Tim McVeigh saying, this is what I was thinking. This is what I, what I did, and so on and so forth. Um, one last one. Yesterday, Melissa and I were listening to Glenn Beck, your favorite person. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not crazy about Glenn Beck, to be honest with you. Uh, but he was on the radio, and I had it on in my truck. And that's why I say Melissa and I were listening. We were going somewhere, and the radio was on in my truck. And uh, Glenn Beck was talking, uh, or he actually 
got an interview with the daughter of the man who was murdered on Easter Sunday in, in the, for, by the guy in Cleveland who took that innocent man's life. And I'll just tell you something. What the daughter had to say was fantastic. And it was just really a great interview. Her perspective on it was... She, she has to know Jesus. That's all you could say. Is her father must have known Jesus, and she, she must have known Jesus. And Glenn Beck was talking about the legacy that a man leaves, and I thought, man, his daughter... He did, he did leave a legacy. He really, she, she just had such a wonderful perspective on having her father senselessly murdered. She was so kind, so compassionate, and so reasonable. You just thought, boy, what a person. What a person that was. And what a person he must have been to have raised a daughter like that. It really spoke well of her. Well, here's Hezekiah's exclusive interview on being told by God that his sickness is unto death. Did you notice the first couple of words in the in the headline, if you will, the first couple of words in chapter 38. The Bible says, in those days. In what days? Well, do you remember what days are in our context? you got the Assyrians threatening to wipe out Judah, threatening to wipe him out, and writing long letters. This guy, Rapshika, is coming and, and uh, in front of the people, trying to publicly shame Hezekiah. And then when God made him leave, because he heard rumors of a war somewhere else, he wrote a letter to Hezekiah saying, I haven't forgotten about you. I'm going to come back and I'm going to smear you. And, <laughs> I mean, I know that that's a, a pretty fast summary. But for Judah, there's a serious conspiracy going on. It's a conspiracy of the Assyrians along with Israel. And they're threatening to literally just eradicate all the Jews in Jerusalem. And uh, it's, it's, it's tough times to be a king. It's a very tough time to be a king. Here's one of the things Rabshika said. He said that, he said, I'll tell you what. Give pledges, I pray thee, to my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give thee 2,000 horses, if thou be able to, on, on thy part, to set riders upon them. How then wilt thou turn away the face of one captain of the least of my master's servants? You talk about trash talk. You talk about a guy that's confident in his ability. He talked about, you think your God's going to save you? Look at what happened to, and he listed the gods that he had defeated. And then he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. You go find 2,000 guys to sit on horses, and I'll give you horses. And let's see if your 2,000 guys can defeat one of my captains in battle. Now that's a pretty audacious smack talk, isn't I don't think he would have delivered on that. I would have said, well, bring me the 2,000 horses. That'll be a start. Well, you know, we'll get rolling here. But uh, the fact of the matter is, I mean, you talk about a guy that is really trying to demoralize Hezekiah. That's what's going on. And now he gets sick. Could you and I say that this is no time to be sick? I mean, this is no time. I mean, it's like, you know, it's like you're in the most important war, the most vital time in your perspective of your life or in your perspective. Of course, everything's bigger when we're there, right? And so in your nation's history, there's never been a more vital time for Hezekiah to be on his best game, and now he gets sick. Some of us will be saying, God, you know what's going on here? God, are you involved in this? I mean, remember Hezekiah's response last week. We talked about the contrast between a courageous king and Hezekiah. The truth of the matter is that Hezekiah, you could not say is courageous, but he understood his need. And he took the letter and he laid it before God. And he said, God, this is what they're saying about you. And God, you've got a problem. And that was a pretty good response, actually, wasn't it? Hezekiah said, God, they're blaspheming you. God, you've got to defend your reputation here. You need to do something about this. And he responded correctly, and God told Isaiah, Okay, Isaiah, you know, I'll take care of it. By the way, you're going to die. I said Isaiah, it was Hezekiah. That's a, rough, that's a rough time, isn't it? I mean, you talk about emotional highs, emotional lows. Don't hate me now, but Hezekiah is an emotional guy. Actually, I mean, he's a guy that really, you don't have to wonder what he feels or what he's thinking. He's, that's just, that's the way he is. And so, 
uh, a couple thousand years ago, he was a millennial. So, <laughs> really, uh, he just, I mean, let's look at what he says, what he thinks. So we've got the story, but the story's not emotional, is it? It's, it's just facts. And a good journalist doesn't actually share emotions, does he? A good journal doesn't, doesn't really, a good journalist doesn't share a perspective. But Hezekiah said, I want everybody to know the way it was. So let's read it. Verse 4, Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah, saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord God of David thy father. Again, don't you love the way the Scripture refers to, talks about Hezekiah? God of David thy father. Was God every bit as much Hezekiah's God as he was David's God? Yes, he actually was. I think Hezekiah was a better man spiritually than David was. You say, Pastor, what do you mean? Well, you tell me, you show me Hezekiah's shortcomings. So, oh, there's one in this passage of Scripture. Well, God doesn't, God states it factually. He doesn't really condemn Hezekiah. You don't see him you know, going through a major repentance over it. Here's what God said. He said, I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city. Well, that's great, isn't it? What did he say before that? He said, I have seen thy tears... Behold, I will add unto thy days 15 years. Now this is interesting, isn't it? God said to Hezekiah, I've seen your tears. I will add unto this city, or I will add unto you, thy days 15 years. Do our tears move God? Hezekiah's tears move God. God said, Hezekiah, I've seen your tears and I'll give you 15 years. So let me just tell you something. Let me help you with something this evening. I want to say this in too glib a way because you may take me seriously. The fact of the matter is that I actually have feelings. Do you know that? I can have my feelings hurt. and They, they get hurt frequently, actually. Um, I have feelings for your feelings. I know that that seems like a hard, a hard thing for you to believe, but I actually care how you feel. And I feel your feelings. Probably more so than people uh, realize because generally speaking, um, I, I'll say what I feel instead of crying. In other words, I don't, I don't cry and say I feel terrible. I say I feel terrible when I feel terrible. Instead, you know, usually, usually I don't cry too much normally. Um, and uh, I don't, uh, you know, I don't get down or up. I try to even keel. Try to be, you know. But... Let's tell you something. It wouldn't really matter to Hezekiah whether Isaiah or anyone else really felt his pain, would it? Listen to me for a second. I'm going to say something relevant. It's important. You don't need men to feel you. God does. You don't need men to be sympathetic towards you God is. Men are so fickle anyway, aren't they? Sure. You just, I mean, honestly. Men don't love sinners the way God does. Aaron Hernandez committed suicide this morning. Taj and I were both talking about it. We both felt, we both felt sad, didn't we? Yeah. We had an emoji. We had to put a sad emoji. You know who Aaron Hernandez was? He was the, what, the defensive end? Or tight, tight end for the New England Patriots in his 20s. Played football with Tim Tebow, but he played for the New England Patriots and was good. A very, very good uh, tight end. And he murdered some. He, just, he was just a thug. I mean, the guy was just raised with thugs. And they killed a guy and tried to cover it up. And so Aaron Hernandez was in prison. It's just really, his life is just really, really tragic. If you looked at the case, if you saw what he did and what he was involved in, and you saw what he did, you just you just hate the guy. I mean, you just that guy's a real jerk. I want to tell you, it's a real tragedy that he committed suicide this morning. I'll tell you why. Because he's probably not born again. And I'm going to just tell you something. It's really tragic because. He actually was the product of his environment in a lot of ways. Yeah. He was raised with a bunch of thugs, and he turned out to be a thug. 
And it's too bad. But you know something? Jesus died for him because God cares. So, you and I don't need men to be sympathetic of us because God is. We don't need men to feel our pain because God does. More than any man can. I'll just tell you something. If you watched, and I did, I watched some of the things that unfolded in Aaron Hernandez's court case, and he was just a thug. I don't know how else to describe him. He seemed as though he didn't have a soul. That's the way the man seemed. And watching that court case, anybody who did really kind of lost any kind of love or respect for him. But God cared about him. Do you see where I'm going with this? In other words, your tears matter to God, and it ought to matter more to you that they matter to God than it should matter to you who your tears matter to. In other words, if I cried, would anyone care? God does. Who else matters? Who else could be sympathetic at the right time and unsympathetic at the wrong time? You know, sympathy misplaced oftentimes is very wrong. And a lot of times men have sympathy for things God doesn't. And men don't have sympathy for things that God does. So God's got the perfect balance of sympathy and empathy, doesn't he? Okay, so this is, what, this is what we find out. Now let's look at Hezekiah's letter. Verse 9, The writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, when he had been sick and was recovered of his sickness. So he refers to himself in the second person, and then he switches to the first person in verse 10. So this is eyewitness report, if you will, or these are the exact words of Hezekiah. He said, I sat in the cutting off of my days. I shall go to the gates of the grave. I am deprived of the residue of my years. So, he definitely immediately expresses that he feels deprived, right? That's what you could take from verse 10. I, Hezekiah said, I've been deprived. In other words, he feels as though he has had taken from him that which rightfully belongs to him. He's just being honest about it, isn't he? Now let me ask you a question. Did, Isaiah, did Hezekiah deserve to live longer? Who deserves anything? What are we the way that we've been born? We're the enemies of God. How long should an enemy of God be allowed to survive? How long does he deserve? Josiah says zero. He shouldn't be allowed any time at all. And so, here's my answer. Hezekiah, you got to live this long. Be thankful for it. That's enough. Is that fair? Sure. More than fair. You don't deserve anything, so quit whining. That's my answer. Okay. Then he said, Mine age is departed. Or, I'm sorry, verse 11. He said, I shall not see the Lord... Even the Lord in the land of the living, I shall behold man no more with the inhabitants of the world. Now, here's in more of a modern vernacular what he's saying. I won't get to see God in this life. And I won't get to see man in this life. And my response is, do you have eternal life? And if the answer is yes, and it is, then why does it matter? Why does it matter? You know, it's tough, isn't it, to see young funerals. And one of the things that people say when someone dies at an early age is they say they died too young. What do they mean? Well, they just didn't get to experience enough in life. And so in a very spiritual way, and I'm not saying, quote, spiritual, I'm saying a spiritual way, Hezekiah said, I don't get to experience God in this life as much as I could. And I don't get to experience relationships with men in this life as much as I could. To which I say, well, if you've got eternal life, what in the world does temporal life matter? That's perspective, isn't it? But guess what? The facts don't change the feeling that Hezekiah had that he'd like to live longer. Could anybody here today testify, you don't have to, but I'm just saying, um, 
hyperactively. <laughs> hypothetically. I like to use, just use hyperactively. Anyway, could anyone say hypothetically this evening that even though you have eternal life, you don't want to die right now? Yeah. Most of us. I have eternal life, but I still want to live. This life. Now, I think that there are a few reasons for that. For one, I think eternity isn't real enough and probably... This life is too real for us. But God's sympathetic to that. He knows it. I'll be honest with you, and this is, this is what I say to spiritualize the fact that I want to die right now. I want to have more rewards in heaven. I want an opportunity to live for God more. And, and this is honest truth. I feel like, you know, this song keeps coming up in my head. I wonder if I've done my best for Jesus. I feel like I haven't done enough for Jesus. So I'd like to live long enough that at least I could do more for Jesus. So, I want to, you know, I don't want to die. And it could be, you know, I just, yeah, I'm afraid to die. Probably not so much of that. But Hezekiah is just being real and he's just saying, I, I want to experience more of this life. And he, he spiritualizes it by saying, I want to experience the Lord. And I want to experience man that the Lord has made. <laughs> he wants to live life. We agree. We feel the same way. So here's what else Hezekiah had to say. He said, It isn't fair, verse 12, Mine age is departed and is removed from me as a shepherd's tent. I have cut off like a weaver my life. He will cut me off with pining sickness. From day even to night wilt thou make an end of me. He said, It's just... It's too temporary. Life's too short. It hasn't been long enough. Verse 13, I reckon till morning that as a lion, so will he break all my bones from day even to night without making an end of me. Verses 14 and 15 make me uncomfortable. Verses 14 and 15 make me uncomfortable. And you just have to understand because it's just like I try not to be this kind of a person. Verse 14, he said, Like a crane or a swallow, so did I chatter. Uh... Have you ever spent a night on a lake shore? Anybody ever slept on the shore of a lake where there are a lot of cranes at nighttime? Remember Shermerhorn's place, 4 a.m.? Dr. Shermerhorn lives in, uh, in Lorita on, on Lake Istic Poga. I'm going to tell you something. You better close your doors and your windows because when 4 o'clock comes around, the cranes start yapping. They, they sound like a bunch of monkeys at like at 4 a.m. And I mean, they're loud and they just chatter and chatter and chatter. They're just tickled to death to be awake at 4 a.m. And I'm not usually so much. It's loud. I mean, you think, oh, I'm out here with nature. Everything's quiet. No, it is not quiet. It is <laughs> deafening. <laughs> and that's the way cranes are. And swallows are similar. I mean, roosters have nothing on a crane. Just in case you wanted to know. We're not talking about the kind of thing that you lift things, you know, a machine. We're talking about the bird crane. Everybody get that? Cranes are, they just, they're just so loud and they're just like, da, 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 You know, they make all this noise. And that's Hezekiah. And Hezekiah, he's giving his testimony. Of course, he's coming on the back side of it. And he's like, I was just like, And then he said, I was like a dove. I just cried. And I, you know, I've, I'm tough on my friends that are this way. I'm just like, dry up, man. Get a hold of yourself. You know, it's just... <laughs> control yourself for crying out loud. Just stop talking. And stop... You know, it's like... He's like... Tch, 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 and then he's like... Bleh. He's like, goes from one to the other. You know, for this frantic, you know, can't shut up, like... Da, 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 da. <laughs> you know, stop it. But this is Hezekiah's testimony, not mine. You know... If I were to write it, I'd say, I felt these things inside, but I didn't share. <laughs> I felt like a crane and a swallow, but I spared everyone around me. And then I felt like a dove crying, and I also spared everyone around me. Not Hezekiah. He said, I just... Da -da 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 -da. <sighs> okay, this is a story. It's a great story, isn't it? Eyewitness account. First person. We already 
know what happened, by the way? Why is this in the Bible? I'm not asking it. I'm not asking just rhetorically. I'm wanting you to think about this. We already got the account. God said, you're going to die, Hezekiah. Hezekiah said, please no, God. God said, okay, you get 15 years, and I'll make the Assyrians go away. That's the whole story. Why is this in the Bible? Why do we have to hear Hezekiah about his whining and his crying and his chattering? Well, because he's a lot like us, actually. He's a lot like we are in many ways. And God loves him. Look what God said. Hezekiah said, O oh Lord, by these things men live. And in all these things is the life of my spirit. Did you see that verse 16? O oh Lord, by these things men live, and in all these things is the life of my spirit. So wilt thou recover me and make me to live. In other words, Hezekiah said, this is the way life is. This is the way men feel. And here things become suddenly very, very relatable, do they not? I don't think everybody's a Hezekiah. Some people are more, I think that one of the biggest contrasts in our text last week and this week is the contrast between David and Hezekiah. I mean, David, David would mourn, David would grieve, David would cry out to God, but I never saw David as a just chattering crane or swallow or a dove. I saw David saying, God, I need to know how you want me to kill these folks. <laughs> I mean, that's poor David, right? Personality, when he sinned, he grieved, but he grieved because of his sin. He didn't grieve because, oh, they're going to get me, you know. You know, sometimes he'd say, how are they increased that trouble me? Many there be which rise against me. Many there be that say of my soul, there's no help for me and God. But then all of a sudden he'd say, but I'm going to get them. <laughs> In other words, God's going to help me. I'm going to take them out. And so, but Hezekiah isn't that way at all. And, here, and I love the contrast in the scripture. And here Hezekiah said, this is the way it is. This is the way life is. By these things men live. Now, in verse 17, he gets very real. Behold, for peace, I had great bitterness. Did you see that? He didn't say, I got bitterness. I got, uh, instead of bitterness, I got peace. He said, instead of peace, I had bitterness. And here he confesses. He said, you know, I, I gave up peace for bitterness. And it's good that he's honest about this. What is he talking about in bitterness? Well, he's talking about the chattering and the crying, isn't he? He said, I, I lost my peace, and instead I was bitter. You know when you're chattering and when you're bawling, you're bitter. And he confesses, you know, I had, instead of peace, I had bitterness. And here's the great thing about it. Hezekiah was, he never pretended to be everything a man ought to be. But God loved him. God loved him. And here we find in verse 18, he said, For the grave cannot praise thee, and death, death cannot celebrate thee. They that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth. The living, the living, he shall praise thee as I do this day. The father to the children shall make known thy truth. And here he's saying what Solomon said when he said a living dog is better than a dead lion. He said, God, if I'm alive, I can praise you. If I'm dead, I can't. At least in this life. And friend, get this because this is an appeal that God hears and listens to. Why should I let you live? So you can chatter? So you can cry? So you can enjoy all of the lust of the flesh, the pleasures of this life? I'm going to just tell you something. There isn't much appeal to God in that. But Hezekiah had served God. He was one of two kings that put away the high places. He was a king who when God was blasphemed, he called for the prophet of God. He didn't cast out the prophet. He didn't call for a false prophet. He called for a legitimate prophet, Isaiah. 
And he took the letter and he spread it out before God. And do you think God got the glory from that? He absolutely did. And Hezekiah was a man whose life glorified God. And Hezekiah pointed out, he said, God, there's something worthwhile in me. Here's all the noise. Here's all the chatter. Here's all the motion. Here's all the feeling. And here's what matters. He said, the dead can't praise you. <laughs> but I do. Now here's where we ask ourselves a practical soul-searching question. I don't think I could ever say I've done my best for Jesus. Could you? Well, you're prideful and arrogant if you could ever say that. But I think probably not accurate. But could I glorify God? Could my life point to God and say, to God be the glory? If it does not, and if I do not, should I be living? A life that does not glorify God, my friend, is lived for the purpose of self-gratification and has no point in existence. God in His mercy allows some pointless existence so that we have the opportunity to glorify God. But if you're frustrated in life, can I suggest to you it's not because God isn't good, it's because you don't understand what living is. See, I love Romans 12 because it really helps me to understand my reason for living. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Makes sense. God's given you the life to live. If God gave it to you, whose is it to live for? Whose is it? Who do you belong to? Belong to God. It's reasonable for you to live your life serving God. And friend, Hezekiah was a good example of a person who glorified God with his life. And for that, he's a great testimony, isn't he? No, oh, you know, probably it isn't very impressive. Probably it's relatable, but not impressive. That he chattered like a crane and a sparrow and cried like a dove. But that didn't glorify God. But other things in his life did. And here, in the end of this letter, in the end of his testimony, he points out, this is why God let me live. <laughs> this is what I did, and this is what it got. Nothing. But this is what matters. Living to the glory of God. Before we look at God's commentary and His response, it's important for us to reflect and to answer the question, Am I living to the glory of God? Am I living to the glory of God and does anything else matter? And here's what God said. In verse 20, or here's, here's what Isaiah said, God, or Hezekiah, I keep mixing up Isaiah and Hezekiah because they're both in the context. Verse 20, the Bible says, The Lord was ready to save me. The Lord was ready to save me. Isn't that great? In other words, God didn't reconsider. God was ready to save me. In other words, it was well within God's character to say, I want to deliver you. Why do you suppose the Lord was ready to save him? Well, we could probably list a lot of reasons. First of all, because he acknowledged God. A lot of people don't acknowledge God. Boy, if they get a sickness or if God does something in their life where it looks like their days may be numbered, they do everything they can to preserve their existence, but they never ask or answer the question, does my existence glorify God? It's a pretty important question, isn't it? So we've got the chattering, we've got the crying and the bitterness. Bitter against whom? Bitter against whom? Who made the decision? God did bitter against God. And then Hezekiah hit on something that mattered. He said, you know what, it would be good to let me live because I'll glorify you, and I have in the past. Does your life glorify God? Does my life glorify God? It's 
good answer whether or not it's worth living. Isn't it? Now, the Lord was ready to save me. Therefore we will sing my songs to the stringed instruments all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. <laughs> Make the kind of noise that matters. Worship. He said, God was ready to deliver and I'm going to tell about Him. Well, you start talking about God, all of a sudden things change from noise, from chatter and from tears to something that means something. And he said, when I saw how ready God was to deliver me, I'm going to sing His praises. And he said, I'm going to do it the rest of my life. Verse 21, for Isaiah had said, let them take a lump of figs and lay them <clears throat> plaster upon the boil, and he shall recover. Hezekiah also had said, what is the sign that shall go up to the house of the Lord? Now the sign, if we didn't read verse 8, but the sign was, behold, I bring again the shadow of the degrees, which has gone down in the sun dial of Ahaz, 10 degrees backward. So the sun returned 10 degrees, by which degrees it was gone down. So the sun went backwards. God said, Hezekiah said, what's the sign that I'm going to be delivered? And, and that was another point of God's goodness. Because God didn't just let Hezekiah be healed with a plaster of figs. We'll make a fig plaster and put it on him. Maybe that'll make the boil go away. So that Hezekiah wondered whether God healed him or whether he just healed up on his own. God said, just so you know that I'm the one doing this. I'm going to make the sun go backward. How's that rate for a crying, chattering fellow? God ever made the sun go back for you? That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Can you imagine how Hezekiah's plight affected the world? I mean, think if you were working, you know, and you had an agreement, you were a um, salaried worker, and you had to work daylight hours. Hezekiah affected people that day. <laughs> right? I mean, it's like you're working twice as long. In other words, literally, God's goodness was a testimony to the world. I think Rabshika heard about it. The one that blasphemed Hezekiah's God. He was probably out <laughs> fighting a battle, and all of a sudden, the day lasted longer, and he didn't get to rest as soon. He said, what in the world happened? Well, God's going to let Hezekiah survive, and he's going to destroy you. And uh, he stopped the, made the sun go back just so that you'd know. And friend, God got the glory, and he gets the glory today too, doesn't he? He's the same God. He cares about trivial people like me and like you. You say, Pastor, you just trivialized me. Yeah, in the, in the eyes of a Rabshika, you ain't nothing. But in the eyes of God, you're everything. You know, when we esteem men too highly, we trivialize God. And when we esteem God highly, we just put men in their place. It would hurt your feelings less to be trivialized if you thought a lot about God and thought little about yourself. And you'd feel better about yourself if you did it as well. And that's where Hezekiah is able to write this letter. Do you sense a little bit of, the, of Hezekiah that this letter is almost a little bit self-deprecating? I mean, he doesn't have to say, I chattered like a sparrow and a crane and mourned like a dove. It doesn't make him seem more masculine, even in his day. But his point is, is that this is what I was, and this is what God is. And in perspective, this is what I am. What is Hezekiah in perspective? Dearly loved by God. And important enough to heal, to prolong his days, to deliver from Assyria, and to turn the sundial back. And friend, there wasn't anybody else on earth that had that happen for him, so that makes it pretty special, doesn't it? You know you're pretty special too. In God's eyes. 
You say, Pastor, I'd like to be special in men's eyes. Well, it's too bad you don't think much of being special to God because it's a lot more important to be special to Him than it is to be special to a person who doesn't even really know how to think right and feel right without God's help. It's a great message, isn't it? I love Isaiah's account because it really helps me, and I hope it helps you. Father, I pray that you would help us with this to see who you are and what we are. And God, that is everything to glorify you. And Lord, it just works. It just fits. It just makes life make sense. And I pray that you would help us want to glorify you and to thank a lot of you and little of ourselves. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.